So today you're going to be learning about um, poetry terms and you should be filling in a notes page, either the notes page that was available to you um, on Edline that you may have printed out or a um, document that you are opening on Google Drive or Evernote. So the first word in the poetry terms is literal language. Literal language. And I'm sure that you recognize this word, um, literal. Okay, you guys say that a lot literally. And literal language is when a writer says exactly what he or she means. You have to take the writing at face value. There's no hidden meaning to it. Literal language is literally what the writer, is, he's saying exactly what he or she means. Okay. The next term is the opposite of literal language, which is figurative language. And this is something you should remember from your narrative writing unit. Figurative language is writing that has a meaning beyond the words written. It should be interpreted imaginatively, not literally. So this is the opposite of literal language, figurative language. And there are a few different types of figurative language. Um, a figure of speech kind of falls under figurative language. So if we have this figurative language umbrella here, figurative language, underneath it we have figures of speech, and then underneath that we have these, simile, metaphor, personification, and hyperbole. Okay? So the big picture is figurative language. Underneath that we have types of figures of speech which are simile, metaphor, personification, and hyperbole. All of these words you should have heard before from narrative writing. So a simile is a comparison between two unlike things using like or as. So you could say he ran as fast as lightning, which would be one example, or um, she smiled like the sun would be another example. So comparing two unlike things using like or as is a simile. A metaphor, on the other hand, if you remember, is a comparison between two unlike things without using like or as. Okay? So you could say he was a stone. He never moved even when tempted. Okay? Or you could say something like she was a cheetah running faster. That's a comma. Than everyone. Okay, that's a metaphor. If you remember, personification is giving human qualities to an animal, idea, or inanimate object. So, the wind whispers. Whispering is something that a human does, okay, not the wind. So we're giving a human-like quality to something unhuman. And a good way to remember this is that you see the word person right in the word personification. The next term is hyperbole, if you remember. Hyperbole is an over-exaggeration to create humor or emphasize a point. So you could say, it's a million degrees in here. Okay, That would be an indication 
that it's really, really hot. It's not literally a million degrees. You're exaggerating to make the point that it's really, really hot. So a stanza in poetry is sort of like, I like to call it like a paragraph in a poem. So it's groups of words um, in a poem, a group of lines in a poem. So when you see poetry that's separated into different lines, like here's a three-line stanza, and then you see a break in the paragraphs, and then there's three more lines, another three-line stanza. That paragraph almost in a poem is what we call a stanza. Okay? The next one is theme, and this is also something you should remember from narrative. So moral or message, so the so what. In other words, what does it all mean? What is the poem trying to teach us? Okay, what is the message that the, the author wants us to learn? Symbol is also something you should remember from narrative writing. A symbol is something that stands for or represents something else. So we might have a whole entire poem about a flower, okay? But we know, because poetry tends to be really symbolic, that the flower might stand for something else. Let's say it stands for peace, okay? Or maybe the flower stands for happiness, Okay, a symbol is something, uh, something, an object in a poem that stands for or represents an idea. A sound device um, is a device related to the sound of language, and these are the types of sound devices that we have. So again, you have another little umbrella here of sound devices. And in poetry, underneath that, we have rhyme, alliteration, assonance, and onomatopoeia. Okay? So sound devices is the big category, and all of these things fall underneath it. So rhyme scheme, this is a sound device, um, is the regular pattern of end rhyme, and we mark that by lowercase letters. So we have lines of poetry here. And let's say the last word in the line is cat. And let's say we have another line of poetry here, and the last word in the line is bat. And then we have another line of poetry here, and we have good. And then we have another line of poetry here, and we have hood. So we're taking a look at the rhyme scheme, and it's a pattern of end rhyme. So we mark it using lowercase letters. So we start with the letter A, the word cat, we're going to mark with a lowercase a, bat, a lowercase a, because cat rhymes with bat, good, now we have a new rhyme, we'll move on to lowercase b, hood, we have another new rhyme and we're going to move on to lowercase b. So cat, bat, good, hood. If, if we had another word in this poem, let's say it's um, dog, is the last word in the line, then we'd move on to letter c, so on and so forth. Okay? So that's rhyme scheme. Alliteration is the repetition of consonant sounds at the beginning of words. Okay, so let's say we have a line of poetry that looks like this. Sam saw something spooky. All of the letters at the beginning of this word are S. So we have consonant sounds repeating at the beginning of words. And you want to have two or more words in a row. 
in order for it to be con considered alliteration. Okay? Now, assonance is similar, except it's repetition of a vowel sound, and it doesn't have to necessarily be at the beginning of a word. So, if this is our line of poetry, the cat sat on the hat, we have that um, A sound, that short A sound, repeating within the line of poetry. Okay, or we could have Aunt Annie... Oops, sorry. Aunt Annie ate ants. Again, we have that vowel sound, but this time it's at the beginning of a word. Okay? Your next word is onomatopoeia. An onomatopoeia is the use of words that imitate sounds. So this is words like buzz, okay, ban, okay, any words that imitate sounds, growl, roar, that's onomatopoeia. Mood is something you might remember from narrative writing, but mood is the feeling created in the reader by a piece of writing. So how the reader is supposed to feel. So let's say the poem begins with, it was a dark and stormy night. Oops. It was a dark, stormy night night, this makes us think of something scary, so we can anticipate that the mood of the poem is going to be scary, okay? Whereas if it said, the sun shined brightly, and birds were chirping, the mood is a little bit lighter, so it's more of a happy mood. Okay. Your next word and your last term is imagery. And imagery is words that create a picture in your mind. So we often use descriptive language and sensory language, which we talked about with narrative writing. to create imagery when we're very descriptive and we describe things using the five senses we create an image in the mind of the reader okay so make sure you go back through these words if you miss anything and you're going to um, do the rest of the activities that are in this folder